That's a good song. Good morning, church. Hi, family. How are you? Glad to have you guys here with us this morning in the house of the Lord. We're going to stand to our feet. I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. And we're going to be singing a new song this morning. It's called Sovereign. Do you guys know what the word sovereign means? Raise your hand if you do. Sovereign. To be sovereign means to have supreme power and authority. So we're talking about God's sovereignty, how he is supreme and in all power, all authority, all things move when he says to move, all things breathe when he says breathe. Just take a moment for a second, just think about that's the person we're talking to, that's the person we're singing to, that's the person who's here with us this morning. die in this very second. The one who's capable to heal a sickness or disease that the doctors have no cure for, that's the one that we're seeing to. The one who made a way for you to, to run to him, to be loved by him, where there was no way. He, he did that for you. That's the one we're seeing to this morning. God, I pray that it, that your spirit, God, would just well up within us this morning. God, let there just be a, a, a well that springs up from within, Father God, as we sing to you, as we look to you this morning. God, take us deeper than we've ever been before this morning. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to come and be sovereign in this place, God. Come and take the authority, the power, the platform. God, it is yours. All things are for you and by you, God. We say that you are beautiful. We say that you are awesome, God. We say that you are glorious in all of your splendor, Jesus. Captivate us this morning. Captivate our hearts this morning, we pray. In your name, amen. Amen.
to bow before you, our sovereign king, a righteous, merciful king who loves us. We will one day stand before you, Jesus, in all and in one
waiting for him to do something. But guys, the word says that he's already here. He has never gone anywhere. He, is, he said he will never leave or forsake us. So in reality, it's not that we're waiting on him. It's that he's waiting on us. He's waiting on you to really, to really search for him. To meet him halfway. So as we sing this next song, I just want to really encourage you guys to stop waiting. kind of skeptical about this God man that we're singing to and talking about. I just want to encourage you, don't even look at the words, just kind of in your, in your, where you're at, just say, okay, God, close my eyes, help me to hear you, help me to find you. Try to put down those walls that you've built up so high.
time. God is good. It's so good to have you guys with us here. We have a, a youth group from Council Bluffs visiting us. They're on a retreat. Woo -woo! We're so happy to have you guys here. And if this, this is your first time, fill out that card on, under your seats. And um, we'd love to give you a gift and uh, love on you a little bit. Mm, Ron, it's all yours. Welcome. Welcome to West Des Moines Open Bible. We're glad you're here this morning. It's nice to see everyone. Um, Victoria already covered my first thing that I'm supposed to talk about. Uh, anyways, if there's a card, if you're new to the church, there's a card underneath the uh, chairs that you can fill out. Just put the card back underneath there when you're done. We'd like to connect with you on that level. There's also a QR code you can scan up here on the uh, screen. There's also a link that you can connect with us on our Facebook page if you're interested in uh, knowing more about us. So I got a couple announcements this morning. So, the, so Easter's coming up. So the church is in need of little small toy donations and some candy to put in the Easter eggs. So the little toys, I think, have to be small enough to fit in the Easter eggs. So it's just for the little kids for Easter. Uh, table groups for March have officially started meeting. Uh, to find a group, a group in time, please go to the Church Center app and look under groups or under the calendar. Uh, button on there. Uh, if you'd like to host a group, please sign up at the Resource Center out there or see Pastor Andrew. Also, uh, as a reminder, Dining Divas will be meeting here at the church on March 20th at 11 a.m. for brunch, and this is a ladies-only event. Sorry, guys. That's all I've got. Thanks. Am I on? Hello? No, there we go. All right. Um, well, it's the first of the month. We always um, start off our month with a, a mission Sunday, and we um, each month of the year we focus on a different 
a mission outreach program thing, whether it be a church plant or missionaries overseas, um, or different things even right here in our city. And today uh, we get to, um, or for this month, I guess, in March, we're going to focus on the Sober Soldiers group who, um, if you guys don't know, they've been meeting in our building using it every Thursday night. They ha- fill this place. They've done a couple events here on Saturday nights with like 100 plus people in here um, having a good time. And so um, we are going to help them. They're going to come up and share in a bit. So go ahead and uh, head up here, guys. And um, But um, you know, for, for Mission Sunday, anything raised um, towards designated missions for this month um, will go to their vision and what they want to do in our city. So um, go ahead, guys. Platform's yours. I'll come up and pray for you guys when we're done. So, um, yeah, you're right here. You know about it. I waited a long time to be up here on a Sunday afternoon. I'm just kidding. Uh, how do I look, Grams? Well, let's open this up with prayer. Jesus, um, we just come to you and thank you for, for your vision, our mission. Father God, just give us um, the words to speak to the church. Give us the words to uh, encourage and lean people out there stuck in alcoholism or addiction into, into recovery, into this family, into this great, this great mission you have us on. Father God, thank you for blessing us and choosing us to walk in this mission. In your name we pray. Amen. Can we start with the video, please? This beautiful day or anything, huh? <laughs> Come on. It's a leopard. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 Rabbi you cannot. It's disease. You can't. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you could do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. can see in the video um jesus is a healing loving god and you know he heals people that are um you know we're dealing with the current situation in modern times which is alcoholism and drug addiction and those are the people that we are going back out there to reach the the people struggling the people shown love those are the people that the church and others tend to should turn their back towards people out there struggling those are the people that we are bringing into this facility every thursday night and, um, you know, and, and, and that just shows love. And mentioning love, I just want to thank Pastor Andrew and Victoria for showing us love. We are those people. Um, those people are us. This is a member of our group, Sammy, as you can see. Um, and, you know, it's just, uh, just a former leper seeing in, in, in the common times. She went from, you know, addicted and drug to a beautiful somebody Jesus has saved. 
and healed. And you know, she's just a member of our Silver Soldiers page. And, and that's just uh, just a form, and you know, that's just what, that's just our modern day leprosy, you know, and then that's the kind of people, we go outside these rooms, we go into treatment facilities, and that's the kind of people that come in here and join us every Thursday night. Next slide, please. This is our Facebook page. This is how we started. Uh, me and Cody and some other members started. Cody and I are the only ones left over from this. I started the page. As you can see, we now have 2.2 thousand members in our group. Um, you know, our group page is just growing and growing. We do a lot of events. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, these are the questions of the day. Monday through Friday, we do questions of the day. We come up with a question. Um, we post them on the page. Members contribute their ideas. We do music Mondays once in a while. And every day of the week, we do a question day just to interact the page, the members, and, and to grow the community and the, the family aspect of, our li of the, the lives of recovery. Um, next slide. These are all the memes I kind of create. I kind of steal a couple backgrounds and put sober soldiers on them. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but <laughs> I do, we do, you know, these are just words of encouragement that go up daily. This is just few of the many um, that we have that we post daily. Other people share on our page all day long, encouraging each other. Um, people having a bad day, they come on our page, they share their bad day, and 50 to, you know, 100 people will comment, just trying to make their day better. And, uh, and, and it's, it's it's been a huge success, and it's been a huge part of my recovery personally. Um, this helps me get through my day. I lean on this, lean on my, my people in my recovery, the people in my life today, and, of course, the church. Next slide. And this is the Valentine's party pastor we're talking about. We turn, you know, we do have tons of events. Dwayne, like I was telling you, the, the following Sunday in church, we had about 120 people in here. Balloons popped everywhere. Um, it, was, it was crazy, but it was the whole purpose of what the sober soldiers do we bring families back together give hope and, and you know help change lives and just encourage people that um jesus loves you know and, and as a church and as believers we are taught to love that you know if you know jesus can heal jesus loves no matter how many times you messed up or how many times um in any situation jesus loves and we should love just like that so we try to bring people in here we got great testimonies like code toby out there Little Dylan, Dilly, um, just great men that have came through and have changed their lives and, and by the glory of God and, and are doing what God has purpose now. Uh, Toby dressed up all nice today for church, as you can see. Uh, but, I mean, and bringing families back together. I'm very grateful for my family here. I know my grandmother has spent many prayers, many prayers for us to be up here, and she joins and sits by me each and every Thursday night. My mama, too, at uh, the Sober Soldiers meeting. Um, and that's, and that's the big part of our, you know, our mission is it's not just about the addicts or something. We encourage the family members, and we bring in the family support. Um, my grams is taken in, and Melissa, um, another great testimony to, this, to the Sober Soldiers family. And just people like her and, and people have taken, my grams is their grams now. And we come in here, and we do family events, and it's, it's a family environment that just shows hope and recovery. And uh, if you go to the next slide, please. This is after the Valentine's party when me, Pastor, and CJ and Cody were uh, caught in the hallway, kind of exhausted. But just, um, just you know, this is when Pastor kind of asked us, to, told us about the mission and, and what we we're preparing to do. I was super excited about it and uh, now I'm a little nervous, but I'm, I'm doing okay, I think. Um, but that's just the great moments, you know, uh, Bob captured. Bob, thanks for that picture. Um, those are just moments and ideas of, you know, a future, you know, I, we got the picture taken and. And, you know, someday we hope to be that picture, just remind us of where we started and where we came from. We hope on this mission, and, you know, um, AA and NA didn't start just from nowhere. You know, they started with an idea, and they've grown into what they are. We, um, I do work in an AA program. Cody here works in an NA program. And, um, you know, but we, we wanted something more. So we started recovery and community family, and that's what we're about. We're, we're, we're all on the same mission, and it's just staying clean and sober to benefit our family's life. Because without God in recovery, we wouldn't be where we are today. And without God in recovery, our family would not have us um, like we are today. Next slide, please. This is our one-year party we had here. Um, many of you don't know. If you don't know, I met Cody a year ago in January at, at Prelude. Um, he came in actually on January 11th. And meeting Cody there... Um, the word faith or the word God. Um, you guys know Cody as Cody now, you know, coming to Bible study, funny Cody, good Cody. But when it was stuff like that was mentioned in the treatment center, 
I would see, I'd sit across there and I'd see him lose his attention. He was squeezing his little stress ball and he would just, <laughs> you know, he would not, um, not really, he was not focused on it. What God has done in this guy and brought a brother in Christ to me and to my life um, is just nothing short but a miracle. So without further ado, Cody Larson. So um, thanks for letting us come here. And I, I'm a little nervous, a little shaky, so I got a, a whole new um, amount of respect for you, what you do here. Every, every Sunday morning to come and stand in front of everybody is a little... It's a little nerve-wracking, you know, and, and hopefully you guys all receive what we have to say and understand our mission is just, uh, like TJ said, bring together families and love and hope and, um, you know, reaching our hands out and, um, you know, go, sorry, I'm not good at that yet. <laughs> reaching, our, reaching our hands out and uh, pulling, pulling the next uh, suffering addict out, you know, uh, out of the streets. And um, uh, if you go to the next slide here. Um, so me and TJ started at Prelude, uh, which is... Uh, Maybe a couple people in here know about it. Um, we, uh, it's a treatment facility. It's a 30-day or 28-day program, and um, they basically give you the tools and, and um, knowledge. It's, you know, um, uh, not really, the, not really the, the people that teach you there have lived it, but they understand it, and they, you know, they give you the knowledge and the tools to, to bring you to a, a right mindset to allow you to uh, you know, begin your journey in recovery. Um, a lot... Um, a year into our journey, <clears throat> um, we were allowed to go into Prelude. And if a lot of people uh, are familiar with uh, facilities and programs and stuff, they don't really allow, uh, it's a touch and go subject when you start to talk about God in a facility, in a, in a medical facility, a state-run facility. You know, some people uh, frown on it, some people uh, flourish in it, you know, they enjoy that. Um, uh, we're, the first, we're the first group in Des Moines that has been able to go into a facility and not change who we are to spread how we got to where we are. You know what I mean? And, and so this right here is a, just a testimony to the, um, this is like the first group. You know, this is the first group of people that come to our meeting on a Thursday night, uh, all from uh, uh, Prelude. And, uh, you know, uh, I can't speak to everybody's um, walk right now and what they're doing, but I know there's one sitting in this room right now, maybe two. God has and blessed his wardrobe. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's just, a, it's a huge part of what we're doing, but it's a small step in what we could do with more help and uh, uh, more knowledge. You know, the, the uh, whatever you guys have to share with us, you know, we, we we receive that in and we and we share that with everybody else. So, if you go to the next slide, um, so we we do a lot of interaction on Facebook, and uh, this ac actually this woman here was uh, in treatment with us, and um, you know she was having a rough day. And she posted that on Facebook, saying she was having a rough day. And I don't know. It's probably kind of hard to see on there. There's like 75 positive comments that came up within less than an hour of uplifting messages. And you got this girl. And, and um, keep going. Keep your head up type stuff. And, and it just a, it, it brings joy to my heart to know that the only way that all 75 of those people are connected to her is they sat in her same shoes. They understand addiction, and they want better for their life, and they don't want to see anybody else struggling. So they, you know, they share that positivity. Uh, in the middle there is a little post that I did, and um, I believe if I post something on Facebook, that if somebody else comments on it, that I need to interact with that person. And I'm whim on a Friday night. I put, if you're an Acton member, say hi. Little did I know, for the next three weeks, I would be conversating <laughs> with 650 people. And still going on a daily basis, and it's 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 amazing thing. I, I've I've uh, you know put myself out there. This is not this is not the person I used to be. I could not hold this microphone and and conversate. I was I, I was a nervous wreck, you know. And um and, and I owe a lot of credit to this man here. You know, he told me, "Have you ever just prayed about it?" And I went in my room that night and I prayed about it and I cried like a baby. I and I I'm gonna cry now just talking about it. But I woke up that morning and I no longer had that ton of bricks on my back. You know what I mean? And that's my testimony to what Jesus and God have brought to my life. And, and he's right. I would have never even had this conversation. You know, I, I, it would have never, it's never been my first thought. My first thought's always been wrong. Now my first thought is, uh, you know, pray, you know. Uh, you go to the next slide. So we're starting to introduce some, um, some very positive recovery stuff into our, in, our, in our group, and I urge you guys to come out and, and listen. Our group is all-inclusive. 
We want people there to support the people in active addiction. And you guys would be surprised at the amount of knowledge that you could gain for your personal life, even if you don't have a, an, an issue with a drug problem or alcohol problem. Or, you know, we even have people overeating problems uh, come to our group or, um, you know, any array of, of, of uh, excessive addiction. If you look up the word addiction, it's, it's overdoing anything, right? I mean, basically. And so uh, you'd be surprised. I urge you guys to come and hear this lady's testimony. She's got 24 years clean this week. And she's going to give a testimony. This church will probably be the fullest it's been in a long time. You know, and uh, uh, I forgot what the next slide was. What's that? Oh, every every month moving forward, once a month, we're going to have a testimony night. (coughs) And uh, uh, our testimony is going to be in June. We figured, um, you know, give the the people that have kind of set this foundation with us, you know, everybody knows her as Mama Sandy. Uh, You know, it takes a lot to gain that title Mama. You know what I mean? But um, uh, there's probably, on average, every Thursday night, about 60 people that come here. Between, between 40 and 60 people that come here, on average, every, every Thursday night. And uh, every single person in here calls her Mama Sandy. So she's the first person we chose. She's got an amazing story. She's been through so much in her life. And here she is, alive and well and kicking and smiling. So uh, go to the next slide. All right. So I'll introduce CJ. She was brought on board by, by me and TJ to... Um, to do the smart people things, you know, the, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, she, she is. So, and, and I, I get a laugh out of saying that, but I'm really serious. You know, like, <laughs> like I am the person that you guys drove past holding the sign begging for change and cigarettes. She's the person that knows how to do computers and make this fancy slideshow and all kinds of stuff. So we really appreciate her. And she's just been such a blessing to, to our foundation and building this. And um, she's going to explain uh, more about the mission, uh, uh, more about our goals, and um, basically why we're standing up here today. Thank you. What's up, Kobe? So, as Cody, or Cody said, I'm CJ, uh, and I'm the glorified secretary treasurer of Sober Soldiers. And <laughs> thanks. I'm nervous too. This is out of my element. Uh, I'm normally a behind the scenes girl. Uh, Sober Soldiers uh, means a lot to me personally. I grew up in um, an addicted um, parent, had my own addiction, um, you know, husband that was addicted, like, so much. um, And I lost hope for not having any place to go, not having, you know, just praying, but never seeing results. (laughs) Never seeing (laughs) results. I got you. Thanks, Cody. But, uh, and see, just like that, Sober Soldiers, they got you all the time. (laughs) Uh, And so, but Cody and uh, TJ's story just brings so much inspiration because, like I said, I, I, there was no hope, you know, no hope for finding, you know, for my parents. (laughs) See, they got me. Uh, But there's no, there was no hope. And so, uh, their story with, you know, TJ's grandma praying for him all the time and just praying and praying is, you know, it's a full circle of how God works. It doesn't happen overnight, but when it does happen, it takes off and it's exciting and it gives me goosebumps to see God in action, you know, and Cody, you know, TJ lifts Cody up and uh, what it, you know, use that, you know, reached back, like I said, lifted him up and brought him on board. And their testimony, they're two different people, but their stories impact so many other people out there. They can reach anybody with their stories, you know, from a family member to uh, children uh, to just, like they said, any kind of addiction. That's what Sober Soldiers is for. It's just there's no NA, no AA. It is... Just come, because recovery is an individualized program, and this is an individualized program for everybody. doesn't matter your gender, your race, your orientation, anything. Just come and be loved and get knowledge when you go. And that's what Sober Soldiers really, you know, for me, it shows the hope of all the prayers that I thought were God wasn't listening to. It's just right here in one room with two guys. And so I believe in them. I do. Uh, I believe in them so much. 
you know, I'm up here with them supporting these two guys I'd probably never hang out with in my life. And I just love them. <laughs> I'm just being raw and honest, but I love them. And <laughs> but, uh, but I love them. And I could imagine, you know, not having, you know, not being on a journey with two other people, you know, than these two, you know, is very God-led and God-blessed. You know, we're just vessels for God. We really are. And, uh, and so that goes into sober soldiers. Um, but my, my personal uh, testimony is uh, community evangelism. My home, like I said, was horrible growing up. And the only way that I knew of God was people knocking on the door, leaving stuff, Jehovah Witnesses, you know, any kind of religion that came and knocked. And it wasn't so much. So I encourage anybody to do that because it wasn't my parents they reached. It was that little girl looking at them, reading their pamphlets my parents threw away, reading the Bible they left. That's what got me. So I encourage community evangelism. And that's what Sober Soldiers is. It is just one big community evangelistic, you know, for God and recovery. And that's another reason why it personally touches me. But on Sober Soldiers, so our vision, I kind of flopped vision and mission. But our uh, vision is God and recovery first, because without God and recovery, you really don't have anything after, um, after that, because you have to put those as first always. Um, our mission is to reach every person with addiction and share God and recovery with them. Our core values are God, recovery, family, and community. Um, we, next slide. We offer swag for people to, it boosts us, but not only that, it gives people honor and pride in what they've been through, because uh, a lot of times recovery, um, being just in, the, in any kind of addiction, is shameful. And with the swag of Silver Soldiers, uh, it gives cute attire for, uh, for you to be proud and honor what you've gone through because your, your test that you went through, it's a testimony, and you need to honor that and share it with everybody. Next slide, please. And then, uh, as the boy said, we offer uh, Thursday meetings at 7. Here's... Uh, how it's set up. There's Cody and TJ, um, but it's right here in this room, and it's powerful. We talk about God, and like, personally, when I went to A and NA or other recovery meetings, you know, there's a little bit of a higher power talk, but no, people just give raw testimonies of what God's done in their life, and they're not afraid to or shame. You know, God is there, and you can just feel it in the room, and the, the room majority of the time is filled, filled up. Next slide, please. So what we have are weekly recovery meetings currently, um, prelude inpatient treatment um, for sober soldiers representation, and that's huge. So like Cody said, to actually have a faith-based um, recovery um, group come in and share what God's done to them, um, for them for recovery, that's huge because there's a taboo of, of just religion and business is separate. And so to bring that in two places, it's a huge impact on the community, but it also a huge, huge impact in them because we just give it raw. This is where we came from. You know, give our testimonies and, you know, hopefully we reel them into the group. We give them hope for when they get out because it's only, what, a 20, 28 days. So they have 28 days to get their life together after addiction and when they leave we offer that support to them come to our meetings uh, <clears throat> is what we have right now look at our Facebook page you know like with Molly uh, she's in Fort Dodge and she went to Prelude moved to Fort Dodge and has nobody and she was able to reach out and 75 people were able to help her and walk her off the ledge and then the picture on the right was a few days later of her proud of her sobriety but without us, I'm not saying that she would have relapsed, but she might have. And she has two babies, and she's a full family, you know, a single mom trying to make it on her own and recover. And Silver Soldier's Facebook page offers that support to people. Um, and so what's new, what's coming for us is we're trying to get a nonprofit chapter for Silver Soldiers and a business license. And what's what that does, that opens the door for so much um, – community that we can support opens the door for um, a sober living home for silver soldiers um, where those people that are coming out of prelude we can offer them uh, 
safety and security, support, leadership, um, people that have done it, meetings, you know, morning worship with them, showing them who God is. And we can offer, um, we have a lady who is willing to give 20 uh, week uh, business training. And that's huge. So you think a lot of people, they come out with addictions, a record. And here's this lady saying, we believe in you. And we're going to give you uh, 20 weeks with uh, construction work of training. So there's that um, option for people. Uh, you know, we're hoping to start a website, a blog, where we would uh, reach worldwide people with addiction and our stories. And um, one of my favorite things, which we didn't show with um, Cody and uh, TJ, was during the pandemic, there was no end meetings. And so they have this little video of a couch where they're just sitting on a couch and they're YouTube, face, uh, Facebooking it. And they're reaching everybody with their stories. And it's so, so comforting watching them and inspiring. And it's just, it reaches everybody. And everybody loves it. Some of them are in the park. They're sitting in a park, just five people, four people. And they're just sharing a meeting. But everybody's involved. Um, a YouTube channel. So we can blast this on YouTube and get supporters and uh, revenue sources. Um, a new thing that we um, that Cody found was this nine base based or sorry nine step faith based weekly uh, meeting program. There's a guy out of Ohio, who yeah Ohio, who um, he was straight out of prison, hard knocks you know prison twice, and um, I think his second uh, round he found God and. He created a nine-step recovery faith-based program, and we're hoping to bring that as another um, tool for people to come. And um, it's a non-traditional 12-step, but it's nine steps, and it's all just faith-based, but it's all recovery faith-based. Um, next step, uh, slide, please. So um, to wrap this up, um, I just want to give you some statistics just to show you uh, to kind of back up what uh, TJ started with, you know, leprosy, this is, um, this is huge. It costs America, I want to say, $3 billion a year um, when I was looking up statistics. Um, no, $300 billion a year to fight the war on recovery and addiction. That's a lot of money that uh, nationwide the um, U.S. puts into it. But the overall relapse rate uh, for substance use disorders is between 40 and 60 percent. So you imagine those uh, 28 day, those people in there. How many people? So let's say 40 of those 40 people, uh, 60 percent are going to relapse because they had, because just yeah, there's no programs, no support. And it's just hard to recover. There's so much in re, uh, addiction to get to overcome. Just the addiction of itself, but then what comes after addiction. Um, but less than 20% of those patients who complete a drug and alcohol treatment program remain clean for an entire year. So out of those uh, 40 people, 20% make it one year. And then... Uh, 60% of people who stay clean for two years is likely to remain clean. Only 60% that make it that make it two years are likely to remain clean. And then 90% of individuals who recover from alcohol or drug are likely to experience at least one relapse within four years. And I'm sure, and those are the ones that falling in the 60%. Um, and then 30% of clients complete detox and transitions into rehab. So only 33% of people that are in recover or that are trying to get recovery or trying to get clean, only 33% of those people go actually into a treatment facility. And so there's so many people to reach. There's so many families that need hope, and so many, uh, you know, little girls that need to see their parents. You know, there was this one uh, thing that someone shared on the page about, uh, you know, drugs, what is it, drugs will love you, or drugs won't love you, but that little child waiting for you to get clean will, and it took off, it hit so many hearts, because that's so true, those people are the ones that are abandoned and left 
um, families. And so Sober Soldiers, just to wrap it up, Sober Soldiers, they provide complete recovery for family, for yourself, a community, give you an outlet to share, you know, give somebody a chance to tap into your own gifts and lead, you know, it's not just that God sent us, you know, like Toby, for him to, you know, lead groups and, you know, he's a pretty evangelistic person <laughs> and to see that come out is amazing. And, uh, and so like we do at every, um, the, to wrap it up, like we do at the end of every meeting, if it, everybody can bow and pray and we'll say the Lord's Prayer, our Father. Oh, it's next slide, sorry. <laughs> Last slide. All right. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed by thee name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And awesome. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, of course, guys. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're this month, anything designated for missions will go to Sober Soldiers to help them um, establish their nonprofit and um, all those things towards getting into a, a recovery home. We would like to um, buy a property really within this year and um, start with um, their first Sober Soldiers recovery house and things. So um, anything you guys can give this month to help out with them would be um, amazing. Um, any just like cash or check undesignated stuff given today in the offering box in the back um, will go to them. And then anything marked missions for the rest of the month or um, if you give online um, and mark it as missions will go to um, Sober Soldiers as well. Um, so thanks for sharing. I, again, just like they were saying, I really encourage you guys to come and check out a Thursday night. Um, if you can't make it, um, you join their Facebook um, group so that you can watch the live recording or watch it live. Um, I, it's amazing. It's one of my favorite moments of every every week. I'm not always able to make it on Thursdays, and I'm pretty, like, like I don't like missing. Um, but so, I, I don't know, I just really encourage you guys to check it out, see what they're doing, because they're doing some awesome things um, in our community and um, going after those people that not everybody else is taking time to reach, and that's important. So, um, We're still in our series, um, Finding Balance, and uh, we're using this picture that Solomon gave us in Ecclesiastes 7.18, and he says, It is good that you grasp the one, and you do not let the other slip from your hand, for the one who fears God will end up with both of them and avoid both extremes. I don't know if you could tell, but I'm like pitting out bed. I'm really sweaty this morning. Um, I don't know why. I just have to, like, my arm, like, unstuck when I lifted it up. So, um, but today we're going to look about how to have balance in self-confidence and self-denial. Right, we're going to look at both of these extremes of what does it mean to really deny ourselves, like Scripture says, but also hold on to that side about self-confidence that we can also find in the Bible and um, grasp both of those things so that we can find ourselves in balance in the middle. Right, the world that we live in today is all about self. Uh, we live in this society of what, they, what they're designating as hyper-individualism, like not just being an individual, but going above and beyond. It's all about me and what's best for myself and how do I be me to the best extent that I can, you know, um, and not worry about anything else, right? We're taught constantly, do what's best for yourself, you know, not to view what about the community might need, but because they're not more important than we are. Right? There's literally a section of books, it's the best-selling section for the last 10 years, called Self-Help, right? How to be the best you today, all the way from one step to 365 steps to become the you that you want to be, right? Um, you know, and that section is also now found in Christian bookstores and getting bigger and bigger. You have, you know, Joel Olstein's popular new book, How to Never Stop Smiling. No, I, I'm just kidding. I, I don't think that's a book, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but more like purpose-driven life, Right? And then all of those focuses and all these things, it's becoming big. And is that okay? If we're supposed to deny ourselves, why would we be digging into books about self-help? Right? Jesus himself said in Luke 9, 23, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Right? You must give up your own way. In other versions, it says you must deny yourself. 
right? And this just isn't some one-off statement by Jesus. It's actually recorded um, in three of the four Gospels, this same story. And he says it another time in Luke and multiple other times as well. But in Luke 14, uh, verses 25 through 27, he even takes it a little bit deeper. He says, a large crowd was following Jesus. And he turned around and he said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So, you know, if I went to the Christian bookstore and I opened up one of those self-help books, from that verse, I would expect it to say, Jesus says, hate your own life, good luck. Right? I mean, that's what that scripture is saying. You must hate even your own life to be a follower of Jesus, right? You better not open that book and it better tell you to love yourself or, or to grow in your strengths or become the better you because we better be the best Jesus, right? So let's dig a little bit deeper into what the Bible is saying about this because, I mean, there's a lot more books and I'm sure that they have more in it than that. Um, the word hate there in the original Greek is the word meseo, M-I-S-E-O, and it's translated over most of the time as the word hate, Um, It's the same word that was used when Jesus was talking in Matthew 5 about don't hate your enemy, but love them, right? And really directly translated, that word means to love less, okay? Not, 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 Not necessarily to directly hate, it just means to love less. Right, just like today, we, we use words of the opposite. It may not be fully how we feel, but you're like, well, I don't love pickles. I hate pickles, okay? I honestly, I just don't like pickles. I hate them, and I would say that, but I don't really have like an active grudge against pickles, you know? I'm not like walking through the grocery aisle, and I'm like, I got to go down the pickle aisle just to yell at them some, you know, and because they are disturbing my life. I, you know, I don't, I don't go out of my way to hate on them more than other foods or any of that stuff. I don't really hate pickles. I just love them less than other foods in my life. Okay, and that's what Jesus was sharing when he's talking about loving your enemies and not hating them. He said, you need to stop loving them less than your friends and those people that you care about. You just need to love them equal, love them the same, love them more. So what Jesus was really saying using that same word, he says, you cannot be a follower of Jesus if you love something more than me. Everything else, in comparison, you must love less. Not necessarily actively hate, just love less, even your own life. Right? Even your own life, you should love less than you love Jesus. In Luke 9, 24 through 25, um, this is the verse following the one that says, uh, deny yourself, take up your cross daily. It says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you yourself are lost or destroyed? Jesus starts to to hear the point that that we are to deny ourselves, right, when it comes to Jesus. We cannot live for ourselves. We have to deny. We have to hate or even love less us when it comes to Jesus. You know, this is something that goes all the way back to the Ten Commandments. Usually it's for that you should have no other gods. You know, he needs to be number one. There are many things in our lives that we have to deny to be more like Jesus and really to love Jesus more. You know, just like any relationship that you have, you have to deny parts of yourself to honor that relationship. Whether it means denying, like, yourself to act out in anger or act out in um, some action you know would harm the other person. You know, maybe you even have to deny going and sleeping with other people because you're dedicated to your spouse, right? Or going after these relationships that you have, you have to deny a lot of who you are to stay in this relationship. So of course, we also have to deny ourselves for Jesus as well. We cannot truly follow the greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if we love something more, including ourselves, than Jesus, right? Therefore, we must love ourselves less than Jesus, or we have to hate or deny ourselves for the sake of Jesus. Paul, in his letter to Titus um, in chapter 2, 11 and 12, says this about denying self. He says, for the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, 
righteousness, and devotion to God. To turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. That phrase, to turn, is, is the same as the idea of denying. It's saying, like, I know this is what I want, but I need to turn from it. In other words, like, talk to the hand. No, just get Like, denied and go this way. And then at the end of that little statement, he says, we should live in this evil world of wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Devoted. That, that idea of, like, I'm devoted to my spouse, or I'm devoted to my family, or I'm devoted to those, pulling those people out of recovery. Like, that's what my life is about. Paul, in another letter to uh, the church in Galatia, said, um, in uh, chapter 220 of the book of Galatians, he says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right? My old self has been crucified. And that sounds like the extreme of denying. Right? Everything that I used to be, I've killed. I've taken, gotten rid of it. It's no longer a part of me. I've denied it so that I can be someone who fully lives for Christ who has loved me. Right? Denying oneself is really about choosing to live first for Jesus. Denying those desires of sin, the world, and even sometimes things that could possibly be in some ways good for us, but they're not what God has for us, means we have to deny ourselves. Right, a couple chapters later in um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, Paul says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Then in the next chapter, uh, verse, chapter 6, verse 8, it says, Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the, from the Spirit. Man, that sounds a lot like what Jesus was saying to that phrase of, of try to save or hold on to your own life and you will lose it. But those who deny it for Jesus will find it. Right? Those who live to only satisfy their sinful nature will instead find death. But those who live to please Jesus, to please God, will find everlasting life. Our world, like I said, has so much of an attitude of self. Right, that it even comes into the church and we have a lot of focus that Jesus died for me, so now I must live for me. Right, and we, we start to turn even coming here. Why, why are you even here this morning? Are you just here so you can find what you need for you this morning? Are you here to serve? Are you here to be a community, to focus on what we all need together? Or did you come here for you this morning? Right, it, it filters its way. It's not just outside these walls. It's here in this place. Listen to what Paul told Timothy about what the future could turn into for people who didn't deny themselves. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-5 through 5 says, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people who love only themse- themselves and their money, they will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel, and they will hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Right, man, if I could summarize up the world that's happening around us, I really don't need to because I can just take what Paul wrote thousands of years ago and see how we got here today. But what were those people missing? Well, obviously, the idea of it's not about us. Paul, in just a few verses later, verse 10 through 12, he says, But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, or Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Timothy probably heard from Paul directly at different times in his life saying that idea of it's not I who live, but Christ in me. And he knows that that's what Paul is referencing when he's talking about dealing with his persecution. It's okay because I don't live for me, I live for Jesus. Really, persecution comes from when you're choosing to live for Christ's glory more than yourself. Right? No one in their right mind, worldly mind, 
would choose to live through persecution purposefully. If they had the option, they would just get out of it, you know? Uh, but it was really the highest act of denying yourself and choosing to live for God. It's easy to think of hating yourself kind of in a way, you know? Or loving yourself less when it means just not getting something you want. That idea of denying, like, you know, I guess I don't need that extra cheeseburger today. I can deny myself for Jesus, you know? Uh, but when it comes to, like, I, I want to be alive, right? I want to be able to experience life with my family for as long as I can. But if it comes to me having to choose whether I love Jesus more than my own life, I need to be able to choose to deny myself and choose Jesus. So the one extreme that we hold on today is that we are to deny ourselves. And we need to deny ourselves of everything to the point, even of death, if it means that's how we need to live for Jesus. And that's one of those extremes that we need to hold on to. Now, we have this flip side. So we have this extreme of like, okay, I need to basically be ready to hate everything about me, you know, for the sake of living for God and, and not hate in the active hating, but loving less myself. I need to hold this extreme. But we have this other extreme that we find in Scripture. And uh, so we're going to look at a couple stories from the Bible. And Numbers 13, um, this is the Old Testament. Um, this is uh, Moses. You know, they, they've come out. If you've been joining us on Wednesday nights, we're a little bit farther ahead of where we are on Wednesday nights um, and Numbers 13. But, you know, all the Israelites, they've been delivered from Egypt, and they're roaming the desert, and they're headed to this area called the promised land, this land that God has promised for them. And uh, they're right on the edge of it in Numbers 13. It says, the Lord um, now said to Moses, send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I'm giving to the Israelites. Send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out 12 men, all tribal leaders of Israel from their camp in the wilderness of Paran. So those 12 men, one of them being Joshua, who um, later... We, we hear a lot more about, but um, they went out to spy out this land that they were supposed to conquer, this promised land. And they go and they, they search it and they come back with a report, starting in verse 25. And it says, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit that they had taken from the land. This was the report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore. Indeed, it is a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey, and here's the kind of fruit it produces. And they talk about these giant grapes and all these things, and so they're showing them all of this food. And then it says, but the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill, and the Termites live in the wood, and the Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, Along, with the Jordan, along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb, he tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. He said, let's go at once to take the land. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak, and next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought, too. In chapter 14, we find out that they don't go. All of the people basically decided, yeah, that's a bad idea. Giants are there. No, nope, no thanks. I'll just stay here in the desert. Well, at least we're alive, right? This reminds me of another story in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 14. died. Oh, there it goes. The light went off the moment I turned it on. That was scary. All right. Matthew chapter 14. The, the disciples head out in a boat um, over the sea, and Jesus stayed behind. Jesus, they, they just had this full day of ministering to all these people, and Jesus was like, hey guys, I need a moment. I'm going to go be with God over here. Go ahead and head across the sea. I'll meet up with you. And um, they're like, we only have one boat, Jesus. But Jesus is like, don't worry, I got it figured out. And they're like, all right. And they hop in their boat, and they head out across the sea. And, of course, the sea turns stormy because I think when you're in a boat, storms happen. Like, it's just part of the equation. And um, so it's stormy. And all of a sudden, 
you know, they're already a little bit nervous, and they look out, and they see this man thing, some sort, walking across the water towards them. You know, and this isn't a normal thing. They didn't know this story yet. You know, now if I saw a guy walking on water, I just automatically assume it's probably Jesus because, like, I have this basis. They didn't have that. You know, so they, they're like, is that a ghost? And they're afraid. They have no idea, like, what's going on. And um, Jesus says, hey, guys, don't worry. It's just me, Jesus. You know, and they're like, uh-huh. And Peter says, if it's really you, Jesus, tell me to come out there on the water. <sighs> I don't think Peter is the brightest guy. Like, if I was a bad guy, I would also tell him, come out on the water. Like, it doesn't take Jesus to say that, right? But anyway, this, Jesus is like, yeah, it's me, Jesus, Peter. Come out and see me. So Peter hops over the side of the boat and starts walking out on the water. Eventually, he gets so far away that he can no longer reach the boat, but he isn't quite all the way to Jesus, and he starts to see all of these waves and all of these things, and he gets a little bit overwhelmed, and he starts sinking. And he cries out to Jesus, save me. And in verse 31, we find immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So how are these two stories connected? Well, in both stories, God has called them to do something. Right? Both of them wanted what God was asking of them. But they both began to doubt, even though God had called them to it. Right? Let's look at the Israelites. They, like I said, they, they're, you know, coming through the desert. They just saw themselves be, you know, rescued from Egypt. They saw all of the plagues. They, they were rescued through all that. They got delivered from 350 years of slavery. And not only did they just get let go, but they got sent out with, like, all of the Egyptians' livestock and all their jewelry and all the stuff. So they left wealthy as slaves out of Egypt. They crossed a sea that was split for them, and the, the ground was dry. That, you know, it saved them from the Egyptian army. They were led through the desert by a cloud at day, a fire by night. Um, they woke up to food magically appearing to them every morning. They saw water come from rocks. They saw the presence of God, like, in a cloud fall on a mountain and fill their tabernacle. and Like, all of these things. Yet somehow doubt it, right? And then there was Peter. He had literally been walking with Jesus, seeing every miracle Jesus had ever done. He actually believed so much in Jesus that he was like, hey, Jesus, tell me to walk on the water, right? Like, would you guys do that? I mean, I don't know. But we read this, and we often assume these people doubted God. But I don't think they doubted God. I think they fully believed God could do it. They had seen God do too much, like so much that they couldn't not doubt God, or not not doubt God, uh, double negatives, anyways, so who are they doubting? Themselves, right? When faced with life, doubt can really quickly overcome us, right? We know God could handle it. So often we're like, yeah, God can get me through this, but we don't believe that he can do it through us and with us, right? Look back at Peter. He saw all of these waves. He began to sink, and he cried out, Jesus, save me. He, he believed in Jesus, he believed Jesus could save him. That was not, he was not doubting Jesus. That's, he so much believed in Jesus that when he sank, he was like, Jesus, you're the one that's still going to save me. So when Jesus said, why did you doubt? It was only that he was doubting that he could do it through him. We look at the, the spies in, in, the, in the book of Numbers. It says that they saw all these giants, and next to them we felt like grasshoppers, and so they felt the same about us. They saw themselves as too small to overcome the giants of the land. And they allowed all of the people to doubt what they could do. I think in one way, we've been taught as a church to deny ourselves so much that we no longer know that we can do the things of God with God. Right? We can quote all the right scripture, right? Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Ephesians 3.20, now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. 2 Peter 1.3, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. But do you actually believe that? Do you actually live that? Would you step out on water and not sink today? Would you go to a battle against the enemy twice the size of you, more equipped and more confident than you feel, but would you be confident enough to go in with the wind? Because that's what we have inside of us. 
Right? God has placed basically superpowers within inside of us that, that are powered through the Holy Spirit to help us live the life he has called us to do. We've been taught so much to deny ourselves that we forgot almost that God has created us as masterpieces with a specific purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece, and he created us, created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Right? If you created a masterpiece, wouldn't you want it to be out functioning in its design? Like if you worked really hard and you created something new, supposed to, you know, solve world hunger or even whatever, you know, just a little project that you want to do, you, you go work on your car. And when you finish working on your car, you want your car to run and be able to take you places, you know? And um, I mean, if, what if Da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa and instead of admiring the art today, we just use it as a doormat? I, oh man, how horrible would he feel if he was alive and saw that happening? Because like, that's, that's denying its purpose. What if the car was invented to help us travel, but instead we just used it as a piece of landscaping in all of our properties, but we didn't actually drive it or use it? We're literally denying a masterpiece of its purpose. We are God's masterpieces. We have a purpose and a place, and we need to be confident in that and out using us like where God has for us to be. I think we've lost a lot of this because there's some been wrong teachings, off teachings on um, really about our heart, really about our desires. Um, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. It's desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Right, who's heard that verse before? You good? I, it's, it's come up to me at times where I'm like, man, I don't know. I just feel like this isn't right, or I just feel like God wants me to do this. And they're like, Oh, feeling, that comes from the heart. You know what the Bible says about the heart? It's bad. Real bad. You know, you stay around, you stay away from that heart thing. You know, like, I kind of need it. Like, no. Um, but man, how, how many of you guys, like, you desired something. It wasn't sin. It was not against the Bible, but you maybe were told, like, well, you're just feeling it, so you probably shouldn't do that. Right? You can't trust that. This has happened to me a lot. I've mentioned this last week and many other times that I, I, I'm, I'm a daydreamer by nature. God has kind of created me in a way of, uh, like, yeah, no other way, like, like visionary. Like, I, I look at things, and I, I often see, like, what it could be, and usually often, like, too big of a thing. Like, I see a car that's completely broken on um, Facebook Marketplace for $300. I'm like, oh, that could be a sweet car, you know? And uh, Victoria's like, that is garbage. Like, literally, <laughs> literally, it's for sale from the junkyard. Like, don't buy that, you know? And I'm like, oh, but you don't know what it could be, you know? And that, that, that's just part of how I work and how I function. Like, we, we remodeled the church. Some of you guys never saw before, but this was my vision. Like, I came in here, and I said, oh, this is what it could be. And, and can put things together, and it's just how my mind works. But a lot of people... In growing up and in my ministries and different things, I, I come with like, this is who I am. I desire to see things become who God wants, or people to become who God wants them to be and, and things that can be steps above what they are. And I was created that way. And a lot of it comes out of this desire in me. It's not like God spoke to me and said, remodel the church and paint it gray and new lights. You know, like, I don't know, that didn't happen for me. I was just walked in and was like, hey, we could do these things. But it, it's a desire of my heart, but it's something that God has placed inside of me. But many times in my life, I've been denied it because it's like, well, that's not God speaking. That's something coming out of your heart, and we can't trust it. And even running into, like, this sermon and looking at that verse, I, I happened upon countless big-name preacher people who saying, don't trust your heart. Don't follow your heart. But here's the deal. Why the church, I felt, has taught this for a long time, that, that the heart is deceitful. Don't trust your heart. Don't do all these things. The church has also taught that when I get saved, I get a new heart. Right? Create a new heart in me is probably one of the, the most used phrases when, when I prayed my prayers of salvation over and over again at church camp for, you know, years and years and years. That phrase, create a new heart in me. Do I have a new heart or do I have a heart that I can't trust? Right, literally in the same book of Jeremiah, chapters later, verse 24, 7, it says, I will give them hearts that recognize me as the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God, for they will return to me wholeheartedly. 
if I'm coming to God wholeheartedly, that means I'm coming with all my heart that I supposedly can't trust. Right? That's not what it's about. That, that verse in Jeremiah was the old heart before you come to know Jesus. Right? It's not just one verse, too. And, and later in Jeremiah 32 through 39, it says, I will give them one heart and one purpose to worship me forever for their own good and for the good of all their descendants. Right? And it doesn't even just stop there in Jeremiah. In Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, I will give you a new heart. This is God speaking. I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you, and I will take out your stubborn, stony heart, and I'll give you a tender, responsive heart, or a heart of flesh. Right? Oh, well, that's only Old Testament. We can't trust that. Oh, you want to hear from the New Testament, right? Hebrews eight ten. This is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. If on your new heart are the laws of God written on it, do you really think that it could be so far from being trusted? The heart without Jesus is definitely not okay. But the new heart we have from God, when we live a life for Jesus, is to be trusted. Man, God spent a lot of time creating you. Like you're fearfully and wonderfully made like we talked about last week. He didn't just throw you out there and say, don't, don't do anything that you feel. Stay away from everything that you are, you know, because you just need to deny everything. And just live for me. Like God made you with a purpose. You are a masterpiece, and he has a very specific place for you to function. You may not find it right away. It may not be there. It, may, it might be you're the first person to do what God has called you to do. And a lot of people are going to come and say, oh, that's just your heart. Don't trust it. But if you're following Jesus and your heart says, I think I need to do this, trust it. You know, obviously, as long as it's not against the Bible and all those things. But I need you to be who God created you to be. But even beyond that, God needs you to be who he created you to be. There's something in the world that will only come to know Jesus because of you living in the, your purpose. Right? There are a lot of tools out there to help you on your path of discovering who you are. Um, I sent out an email last year with a link um, to a bunch of different like spiritual tests and personality tests just to help you begin to discover who God created you to be. After we finish up this Finding Balance series, I think we're going to go into a series about giftings and stuff just to help us find our design here as a church. But... Um, I, in general, I believe there's a big change coming to the church in America. It's not going to continue to look like what it looks like today. Um, it's just going to be a lot different. And some of you guys may not know your place yet or seem to find it because it's just not quite here yet. But I believe it's coming. Man, the church and God really needs you to be confident in who he created you to be, to understand your heart's desires. So the other extreme we hold on to, you know, we're holding on to this, that I got to deny myself at, at all costs for the sake of Jesus. But on the other side, I hold on to this, that I need to be confident in who God created me to be and the new heart that he has given me. Right? So it, while denying myself, I also need to live for who God's created me as. Right? So what does that life look like for someone who really holds themselves and finds themselves in the middle? Well, Luke 6.45 says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. Right? And then here's this verse that keeps finding its way into our series over and over again, Matthew 6.21. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Good things come from the treasury of your heart. Whatever you treasure, your desires will be found there. Right? This is where balance comes in. We have to deny ourselves to the point of treasuring God first. And then those things that we treasure, we're willing to deny ourselves for because we treasure them. Right? Things you treasure, like your family, your friends, even some of your stuff, you'd be willing to die for. Right? People die each year from defending their properties or defending their families from people who break in. Right? They value those things more than their own lives. We hire guards all around the world to protect our treasures, to protect the people and the things that we value most. Right? And so this act of denying ourselves when God becomes our treasure isn't that hard because, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to lay myself down to protect my greatest treasure. And that act of treasuring keeps our hearts in line with God's desires. So then we can trust it.
Romans 12, 1 through 2. This verse was just like pounded into me as a youth kid, and I feel like I'm just now beginning to really understand it. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Truly the way to live for Jesus is to sacrifice yourself, to deny yourself, to love yourself less, right? Stray away from the world, deny the world, deny your flesh, become a new person. Understand your new heart. And that will transform the way you think so that you can know God's will for you. Isn't isn't that like the biggest question that every Christian has? What does God want me to do? Romans 12, 2 says, transform into that new person begin to understand the new heart god has put inside of you and then you will learn to know god's will for you right change the way you think so you can know and recognize what god's will is doesn't that sound like balancing denying yourself so that you can know the mind and the will of god in psalms it said like this psalm 37 4 says take delight in the lord and he will give you your heart's desires I mean, not to go back and rehash an earlier argument, but why would God be giving your heart's desires if they weren't to be trusted, right? Throw that in their face. I'm just kidding. Um, But delight in the Lord, and he will give you your desires, right? Have you ever been in worship, and just instantly there's this feeling of, like, I belong here. This is what I was made for, right? It's just like, oh, this is it. Because we are that new heart. Remember we just read in Ezekiel, it's like, I will give you a new heart so they can worship with one heart and with one passion and purpose, a worshiper for life. That new heart just longs to connect with God. And when you do, it's just like, oh, yeah, this is for me. Right? Or maybe you have this download all of a sudden of like, you're doing something and you're in Silver Soldiers working out your ministry there. You're at, you know, your job and you're telling somebody about Jesus. All of a sudden you're like, This is good, and you just have this kind of feeling, this desire of, like, this is where God wants me to be right now. Those are my favorite moments. And not even just for me. I love seeing people delighting themselves in the Lord and finding their heart's desires in him. Seeing people doing what God created them to do is, like, my favorite thing on earth. Um, You know, and I I think there's a little bit of a catch to that verse in Psalms because, like, the more we treasure Jesus, the more our heart's desire will be for Jesus. So, of course, God's like, well, I can give you more Jesus, you know, because why not? Um, But I think it goes much more than beyond that as well. So keeping our focus on God through denying ourselves what allows us to be able to trust our heart. And to just wrap up here, we'll look back at what Paul was saying in Galatians 6 because I think it's a really great summary. In verse 8, it says, those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from that Spirit. The word life and everlasting life, well, first off, everlasting life, when it says that phrase, we immediately think heaven, right? We immediately go, like, I mean, how many of you guys thought heaven when I said the phrase everlasting life? Heaven or hell, you're like, yep. That's what I'm thinking. Um, but that's, that's not what this is about. It's not about heaven. Everlasting, the word eternal, it doesn't mean heaven. Otherwise, they would have said, and you will get heaven. But that's not the word they used here. They used eternal life. Is what it, when you go into like the original language, it's just you will inherit eternity life. And what we know about eternity, when we talk about the eternal God, we don't just think about heaven, future God. We think about God that's been around for forever. And life that, you know, will continue for forever. Because forever goes both ways. And eternity is happening now. Right? This, this isn't a, a scripture that those who live to please the Spirit will go to heaven. This is a verse that's saying those who live to please the Spirit will live a full life now. Right? That word life, oh, it's a good one. Listen to this definition of the word life um, from the Greek. It says, of the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical life which belongs to God, and through him both into Christ, in whom put on the human nature. In other words, that same life that was so active and alive in Jesus Christ is the life that we can connect to right now. 
The definition goes on to say, life that's real and genuine, life that's active and vigorous, devoted to God and blessed. Right, that sounds like all my heart's desires right there. Th this isn't a promise for going to heaven. This is a promise for what God wants to do in your life now. Remember, you're a masterpiece with a, a specific design, and if we can learn to just focus on living for Jesus and denying ourselves, then we're going to be able to be confident in the life that he has for us to live out now. He wants to give us, and this isn't a live your best life now, like happy thing. You know, I'm not saying like everything's going to be perfect and you're going to have all the money and everything that you need in the world. It just means it's going to be a life that's full right now. Living your best life by denying your life. Paul continues in verse four, 14. He says, as for me, may I never boast in, about anything except for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified. And the world's interest in me has also died. And we can be self-confident if we remember our purpose. Our place is for God's glory and not our own. We are not confident for ourselves, but for the glory of Jesus. Right? I know we went a little bit long today. Thanks for staying with me. All right, let's pray. God, grant us today balance and self-denial and self-confidence. Help us to deny ourselves so that you are loved more than we love ourselves. To deny ourselves to the point of death, if need be, so that you receive all glory. May you become the treasure of our hearts so that we can trust our desires. Create in us a new heart, God. Let us realize our new hearts. Transform our minds that we may know your will and trust the desires you've placed inside of us. May we be confident in the masterpiece you created us to be and help us to find our purpose in the body. But keep us from being overly confident that we may only boast in you alone. In your name we pray, amen. All right, go trust your new heart that God has placed in you today.